Welcome to this episode of Al's Outdoor Adventures. I am Al Lehman, and thank you for joining us on this unique and artistic adventure. As a wildlife and nature photographer, I have developed this passion to educate, entertain, and share special interest topics that our audience will not only enjoy, but also enhance their appreciation for our environment, wildlife, and the expertise of others. This episode of Al's Outdoor Adventures is centered in McCall, Idaho, where you will meet Mr. Dave Alexander. Dave is a resident of McCall, Idaho, a retired Payette National Forest supervisor, and a highly acclaimed wildlife woodcarver. Dave's talent, skills, and realistic carving passion will inspire you and generate a deep respect for Dave's capacity to create very realistic hand-carved wildlife art like no other. We are going to begin this video with a brief bio from Dave in his studio, followed with Dave presenting his carving process and a display of his prized work. So please grab a beverage, sit back, and enjoy this video presentation, Wildlife in Wood. Well, I grew up in Texas, long ways from forests, but I, um, as a as a boy, was totally immersed in hunting and fishing. I played sports, baseball and basketball, but I was really uh, had a passion for hunting and fishing. And uh, because of that, I chose to go into a career that was going to keep me outdoors. Uh, and I got a degree in forest management from the university in Texas, Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, during my time at Stephen F. Austin, I took a summer job for the Forest Service in Northern California and fell in love with living in the mountains, just thought it was the greatest thing going. So I went back and finished my degree and my wife and I my, my new bride at that time, and I moved to a little town called Happy Camp, California, and started my Forest Service career in 1967. Um, I worked my first 14 years in California on the Klamath, the Tahoe, and the Los Padres National Forests. I was a district ranger on the Los Padres. Then I moved to Oregon, worked on the Willamette National Forest as a district ranger on the Detroit Ranger District, and was the deputy supervisor on the Rogue River National Forest. I moved to McCall in 1993 to serve as the forest supervisor and uh, worked for nine years here before retiring and just stayed in McCall. My wife and I really love it here. And I built a studio, the studio we're setting in uh, upon retirement. I think I built a studio in about 2003. As a boy, I was originally very interested in art. I had an uncle that was a commercial artist, and I uh, thought that that was something I wanted to pursue, but as I got a little older and discovered girls and cars and hunting and fishing, I sort of let that go. But uh, when my wife and I bought our first home in Grass Valley, California, had a fireplace with a mantle, and I was an avid waterfowl hunter and had been uh, for many years, and I decided that I needed to have some decoys for that mantle, and I wasn't able to really find any decoys that I liked, especially at the prices that I could afford. So I decided to carve one, and at that time, I found a book that talked about how to carve a little bit, and I carved a uh, my first bird, and everyone that saw it thought it was just great. I couldn't see anything but the flaws and things I could have done better, so I carved another and another. And after about six months, a gallery saw my work and told me that they'd be more than happy to handle me as a client and uh, sell my work. And that started it in about the mid-1970s, and I've been at it ever since. When I plan and carry out a carving, it's really in three phases, and each phase is about an equal amount of time and effort. The first phase is the phase of doing reference work. Uh, the people who buy my carvings are not looking for something that approximates a bird. They want real exact carvings. So 
this for instance it represents a carving that I'm planning to do soon and that's an American a female American kestrel uh, this is folders of photographs now kestrels are uh, birds of prey and they're you you can't have kestrel skins or so on so I, I take extensive collections of photographs out of magazines and so on I do my own photography and these are some of my photos of a kestrel this is a pile of books with good kestrel information in it I've been an avid wildlife photographer most of my life and I travel extensively doing wildlife photography particularly bird photography so I use my own photos as well as information I glean from books and and go to museums and do measurements to get reference. I then do sketches. This happens to be a kestrel sketch of a pose that I'm interested in here. And uh, I just do rough sketches. They're not meant to be framed or anything, but they're for my, my uh, use on the pose that I'm going to want a bird in. Uh, and, and also the composition. And this, when I mention composition, I do sketches that include the whole, uh, asp all aspects of the carving. This, for instance, is part of the base for a California quail. And it is a carved fence post. I've made the barbed wire and turned the base on a lathe to get the composition that I want for a quail standing on this fence post. I do the same thing for a kestrel or anything else. I've got the entirety of the, of the piece in mind. So after I've figured out the pose and the entire composition of a piece and the, the way that I want the bird to appear, I then began to get into sketches that are very realistic, the exact sizes that, that I want. This happens to be the head of a lesser Canada goose called a cackler. And I've measured the bill. I've got the eye placement. I'm, I'm doing a lot of exact drawings. Here is a drawing of the body. This is for a cackler decoy that was bought by a client in Canada. And I have the profile view and the plan view, and I'm working that out so that I'm translating that to a pattern. Once I've got the pattern figured out and I've done all the drawings, the next thing I do is transform that into a actual pattern to lay out on the wood. This happens to be a somewhat oversized mallard for a commercial decoy company. And here's the plan view and the profile view that I can then lay out on a larger piece of wood, obviously, and trace the bird onto the wood. I then cut that out on a bandsaw. And again, I'm switching species on you. But on the bandsaw, this is what I start with as a pattern. I've gone from the square block of wood through the drawings, got the exact sizes I want, and this is a hand pintail uh, that I've cut out of the bandsaw. You can see that it's very rough. And the reason the head of this pintail is separate from the rest of the block is that the grain on this block is running long ways. And I'm going to have this pintail with its head turned. And the grain would be running across the bill and be quite weak and fragile. So I cut the head out separately, glue it on, and then carve it as one piece. So here's the rough cut, straight off the bandsaw head of a hen pintail. Here's that head partially carved. You can see the knife marks on it where I'm rounding it up, getting the bill to be the size and shape that I want it. And then here is a finished head with the eye hole drilled for me to put a glass eye in. I've carved the bill to the exact dimensions and this is this would be a, a a fairly well completed head i can show you on a mallard 
what a completed head looks like. This is a oversized mallard. It's being carved for a decoy company and they want their decoys to be a little bit oversized. So this is a mallard head with the eyes installed, the bill finished carved. The next step would be to start to carve feathers and to texture the head to make it look very realistic. So as I've shown you, this is what I start with on the on a head carving. Um, coming right off the bandsaw, obviously the bill is way too wide, I've got wood to lose. And so the way that I do that is I actually have taxidermists castings of a bill. This happens to be of a pintail, which is the head that we're looking at. And I actually take measurements on the bills and I begin to shape. So I begin here you see that I have begin to reduce the width of the bill and get the profile the way I want it. And at this stage, I'm generally working with carving knives, small, very sharp knives. And I do a lot of that with uh, detail work on the bill in particular with knives. However, when I'm trying to move a fair amount of wood, I'll use a Fordham tool. I've got a foot control on this Fordham tool. <coughs> very importantly, I have a dust catcher right here that I turn on so that as I'm working right here, the dust is taken away and I also usually wear a mask. But I, I can work with this cutter here. You can see the dust coming off, shaping. Once I get the bill shaped and the head shaped and I've done a lot of this one with knives. Um, I, I do a lot more work with these detailed micro motors. I have four or five of them with different bits on and I do a lot of the detail work on the bill and if I can show you on, the, on this one, uh, you can see the amount of detail in the bill, all the little folds and ridges and that's done with micro motors and with knives. I spoke earlier of the amount of reference work that I do on a carving. Birds that are game birds that we can have mounts or skins from, uh, I actually oftentimes have mounted birds. This happens to be a greater prairie chicken. And uh, I bought it from a taxidermist because I had a commission to carve a great, greater prairie chicken. Now I don't use this so much for all the exact measurements, but I look at feather shapes and colors in particular. So using something like this, I translate that to a carving. And this is a completed gray, greater prairie chicken. I haven't done its legs and feet yet. Let me get rid of the mount. And what I've done is I have carved all the feather groups and each individual feather on this bird to replicate the bird. Uh, only with really good reference work can you get this. This bird is strutting. It's got its feathers up, its tail up. It would be on the lack displaying for females. And it will be ultimately standing on a base like so. The key to realism is carving every feather and putting every vein of every feather into the bird and, and then painting it realistically. I've touched on research and talked a little bit about carving. Painting is really an extremely important part of this. A poorly carved bird cannot be made better by an outstanding paint job but a well-carved bird can be ruined by a poor paint job. So it's probably one of the hardest things to learn. Um, it took me a long time to be satisfied with my painting, and even now I still struggle with it from time to time. When I paint, I have drawers full of paint. And none of the colors of these birds come right out of a tube. 
So when I get ready to paint on a bird, I lay out the colors that I'm going to have to mix. And uh, my palette is right here. I mix my paint a little at a time and paint. And the first thing you have to do, of course, to paint is to really understand the color of a given bird. I'm going to show you a cinnamon teal that I'm just starting to paint on. This is the underpainting, the undercoating. Right here I have a cinnamon teal skin so that I can get my colors right. And as I said, this is the undercoating, so I'm not trying to be exact yet. But I mix my colors on my palette, I paint with uh, I paint with an airbrush. Some you can see back here. I have six airbrushes on a rack back here. I'm a little bit of a an airbrush uh, collector, but ultimately the paint job has to be done with a brush and and getting the softness and getting the highlights and shadows. And uh, so, for instance, on this bird, and I don't know if you can zoom in on it, but every feather on this bird is carved, and every vein of every feather is carved. So by doing it this way, all the, the location of feathers have already been predetermined in the carving, and now what I've got to do is, is bring them together with the paint job. And... Uh, that can be quite challenging. And it's not unusual for me. I paint with acrylic paints. I originally started painting with oils. But with acrylics, the coats are so thin and you lay down so many washes to get the depth that it's not unusual for me to get to a certain point and not like the product and paint it white again and start over. The white underneath reflects light back through the coats of paint so you get a a, a, a really deep feeling, a uh, deep looking paint job. A good example of combining airbrush and and uh, uh, hand work is this prairie chicken that I showed you earlier. Every color on this bird has several values. There's a shadow or darker value, a medium value and a light value. And depending where on the bird I'm painting, for instance, in this area here where the light is going to hit, I'm painting that with highlights. And down here where you're not going to see a little more, there's shadows. And a lot of the a lot of the, the softness of the bird is in painting those highlights and shadows. You never end up painting a brown color. You have three or four values of a brown color. And that brown color may be made up of three or four colors of paint. So it... it isn't a spectator sport. It takes a long time to figure out how to paint, just as it does to figure out how to carve. And the two, when I'm carving, I'm thinking about creating highlights and shadows in the carving that I will enhance with the painting. So you can't carve it and then turn around and independently say, well, now I'm going to paint it. I'm thinking about the paint job way back when I'm creating the, the pose of the bird, where the highlights and shadows are going to be. And as I carve it, I try and do the same. So it, it can be quite detailed and quite time consuming. And uh, it's, it's easy to, uh, to get a little frustrated in, in, during the paint job. And it certainly points out to you where you made mistakes in the, in the carving. Al, I really love birds of prey, and I love carving them. I love making trips to photograph them. I do all the reference work I can. And my favorite bird of prey is probably the American kestrel. It's a, the smallest American falcon. It's only about nine inches long in here. And uh, I've carved many kestrels, 
This one in particular is one of my favorites because I tried to portray the bird just taking off of a dead lodgepole pine limb. So the uh, I talked earlier about composition and in this case I tried to build and carve a lodgepole pine limb that leads your eye up and wings that lead your eye this way so that you focus on the eye of the bird. Um, the American kestrel is a beautiful bird and, and they're found throughout the country. Most people don't even know what they're seeing, but they eat primarily insects, a few small mice and things like that, but, but insects are their primary th thing. And uh, so I'm gonna just turn it here a little bit so you can see the view. I, want this bird to appear to just be jumping off the limb and into flight, just about to make its first downstroke with its wings. To get the feeling that it's flying, I made the feet out of bronze and built them up into the bird. And then this branch is also bronze. And it goes down and is embedded in the carved limb. I, I made the dead bark from this pine out of uh, metal. And uh, I tried to further enhance the composition by using leopard wood, which is a South American wood with these spots. And I wanted you to kind of pick up on the spots under the wings and kind of try and unify. So these are really, really colorful birds. Uh, as I said, they're my favorite. This carving of a black bill magpie and a mule deer skull and antlers is an effort on my part to tell a story. And the story is of the Great Basin. Great Basin is also called the Sagebrush Sea by some people. And it's that area between the Rocky Mountains and the Sierras and Cascades on the west. Um, it was once covered by an ocean, the remnants of which is the Great Salt Lake. And in the Great Basin out in the sage, the main parent material or rock is basalt, which is a which is a volcanic rock. And the main deer species is mule deer. And that's what this is, a mature mule deer buck. And my intention was that I would show where last fall during the rut, this buck broke its antler. And through the winter, it didn't fare well and it died in the winter, it's winter kill. And in the spring, after being under snow and picked at by mice and so on, this bleached white skull attracts the attention of the magpie. Magpies in a family called corvids and they're very inquisitive. They're very uh, um, easily attracted by shiny objects or white objects. And their main job is to be do the cleanup on, on dead critters and things of that nature. They're in the in the West, if you are an elk hunter, for instance, and you shoot a elk in the timber and you're gutting it, if you're out of the timber into the sagebrush, the magpies will show up. And if you're in the timber, the gray jays will show up. They both serve the same purpose in the ecosystem. So I just wanted this gray jay, or excuse me, this magpie to look like it had been attracted by the bleached skull and came down. And the name of the carving is Slim Pickens. It got down here and there's nothing left. What some people are surprised to know is that the entirety of this piece is a carving. Not only the bird, but the antlers, the skull, and the rocks. So I gathered basalt rocks, have a little rock garden in my studio where I pick up rocks and bring them in. And this is, uh, I've tried to carve and paint the texture of the basalt. The skull is from skulls I've found while, while hunting. 
and the antlers are the same. These are shed, and I've, and I've copied them. So this is all wood, and uh, just has a little story to it, which sometimes carvings uh, can display a bit of, of uh, uh, the ecosystem that they're intended to come from. This is an example of uh, carved habitat. There's obviously no bird on it, but I'm planning to put a California or Valley quail sitting right here. And what I've done is carved this fence post to depict an old weathered post with twisted grain, old knots. And uh, at one point it had barbed wire so what I did was I basically carved the post, put all the texture into it and painted it, and then I made the barbed wire out of copper wire. And uh, that's kind of interesting because you'd think barbed wire is barbed wire, but collectors would tell you there's many, many kinds of barbed wire. So I had to kind of research barbed wire to figure out what the style of this barbed wire would be, what the manufacturer. So this is intended to curl around the post. The post is curving this way, the barbed wire is coming back, and together they lead your eye to the bird, which will be sitting right here. This carving is a uh, female belted kingfisher. Belted kingfishers are very common in the valley in my part of Idaho. They're very vocal birds and they perch, uh, they're fish eaters and they perch right in the uh, branches along streams and then dive down and pick up fish. Uh, in this particular case, this is a female, which is where the, the rust colored belt comes across. And I wanted to portray this bird standing or, or perched on a dead lodgepole pine branch right along the edge of a stream. The branch has been dead, it's peeling its bark. The bark in this case is made of, of a metal shaped around the wooden branch. And the cones are also carved. And in lodgepole pine, when a tree dies, the, those cones that are on it persist for a long time. They don't just fall off. So this is portraying the old dead cones in various stages of opening and and uh, it's a very common sight. If you fly fish or raft in our rivers, you see these belted kingfishers quite frequently. Uh, you hear them as they fly along fishing. So uh, I've, I've been attracted to them for a long time and I just thought I would, uh, I've, I've carved several of them, but this is one that, uh, the, the most recent of my carvings. One of my favorite birds is the long-billed curlew. I make an annual birding trip over into the Mount Hewer Basin and the refuge in the, in the surrounding areas around Burns, Oregon every year, and uh, just photographing birds. And one of the birds that we see in the fields, the grazing in flocks are, are long-billed curlews. Um, they are really picturesque birds, but very soft looking. Now this bird, um, is what I call a gunning bird, in that not all of the feathers are carved. It's actually a smooth bird. All the detail you see is in the paint job. And so uh, it's much easier for me to, uh, to make the bird without having to carve all the feathers. But more importantly, when I carve all the feathers, I must paint them just as I carved them. Whereas on this, I could treat this bird as like a canvas and lay out the feathers and paint them. And so it, it has a much different look to it. Um, it's still got all the detail in, in a normal paint job, but it just doesn't have the carved feathers. And I kind of enjoy doing these gunning birds. So what do you mean, Dave, by a gunning bird? Well, I carve several grades of birds in, in a decoy, and I'll explain that as, as I show them to you. But the fancy ones, with all the feathers carved in every vein is called a decorative. The next level below it, which is a smooth bird, but with a fancy paint job, is a gunning bird. 
And then I carve a, uh, uh, for hunters on occasion, I carve actual hunting duck decoys, which is the, the lowest grade that I do. And uh, so this is, uh, there's a competitive class for gunning shorebirds in most of the national competitions. And this, this bird was kind of intended for that. Uh, interestingly enough, I've had it a show or two, and from people seeing this, they wanted the full decorative bird. I've carved two or three of those and, and sold them um, to uh, to people who are farmers or who live out on the land, and they see these birds, and, they, and they're just among the favorite birds of most of the people that get around them. I thought I'd show you a few decoys. I got my start as a carver carving decoys. Uh, I was an avid and am a avid waterfowl hunter. And so I began to explore carving with decoys. And since then, I do a lot more of the decorative carvings of uh, full birds in their habitat. but. I still carve decoys and I have different grades of decoys that I carve and they have to do with the competition. This bird here, Drake Pintail, is a decorative decoy. Every feather and every vein of every feather is carved and painted. All the detail, very thin wing, wing tips, fine tips on the tails. It's all done for ultimate in realism. The bird is actually hollow and it floats perfectly on the water. It's weighted to float on the water and traditionally decoys are judged on the water in a tank at a competition. So this is a, a uh, decorative decoy. It is the ultimate in realism. But I also carve what I call gunning decoys and this example, this hen mallard is an example of that. This bird has not got every feather carved. All the detail is just in paint on a smooth bird. It also is hollow and it is entered in competition, but it has a keel. And the bird is very light, but there's some lead in the keel. So when this bird is judged on the water, it's not set in the water, it's put in upside down and the first thing that has to happen is the bird has to come to the top and turn itself over and float perfectly. Just as this bird had to float perfectly, this one has the added uh, business of self-riding. So traditionally I leave the keels from competition on them, uh, on, on the gunning birds. But this bird, uh, I believe this bird won the uh, People's Choice Award in the uh, Columbia Flyway a few years ago. And uh, so I, I really love doing these gunning birds. And one of the birds that is very common here breeding is cinnamon teal. In the spring, these birds come here and breed and you, I, I photograph a lot of them. Uh, they're they're sought after by people who hunt and collect mounts of, of every bird. A really prime cinnamon teal drake is a beautiful thing. And we, they're fairly common here during breeding season, but they, they migrate early. And so a lot of hunters never get a chance to shoot very many cinnamon teal. Uh, this again is a gunning decoy. So all the detail is in the paint. It does not have the uh, carved underbill and so on. But these are the two grades, the decorative and the gunning that I do for competition. I also on occasion carve hunting decoys, but most people 
don't want to pay the kind of money it takes to hunt over hand carved decoys. I hunt over hand carved decoys myself, and there are collectors who who buy my hand carved hunting decoys. But uh, these are the primary two grades that I do. Hunting decoys are much coarser than this. There's no reason to have this much detail in them. So Dave, uh, on behalf of uh, Al's Outdoor Adventures, yeah. I want to thank you uh, very, very much for allowing us to come into your home here and your studio and have you share your um, your talent and your skills with us. Up. And I'm quite certain that uh, that uh, people will enjoy this. <clears throat> for those of you, uh, at the end of the video, I will provide a copy of, of Dave's contact information uh, if you wish to contact him. Again, thanks, Dave. Thank you very uh, much, Al. We, uh, we appreciate everything you've done and yeah. we'll see you again. Take care. Welcome back. I sincerely hope you enjoyed our video, Wildlife and Wood. We would love to hear your feedback and comments. Simply send me an email with your feedback. And if you enjoyed this film, please click like on YouTube. We would appreciate your feedback. If you wish to contact Dave or myself, I will post all of our contact information on the next video sequence after this one. Thank you again for watching our video, and now it's time for me to prepare for the next adventure. We wish the best for you and your family as you make memories on your next adventure. On behalf of Dave and myself, thank you, and be safe as we all continue to navigate the COVID pandemic.